Welcome to this episode of Bradley in the Bars. In prisons all across the United States, COVID has been devastating the prison population. Here in Maryland, it's then hit the prison population especially hard. I have joining me today two guests that can give us the inside story and the outside story of what's happening to the prison population in relationship to COVID-19. Mark Schindler is the executive director of the Justice Policy Institute, and they do research all across the country. Ms. Pamela Session has a fiance inside the prison system, so she has inside information. So thanks for joining me, Mark and Pamela. Nice Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sessions, do you mind if I call you Pamela? That's fine. That's okay. Fine. Pamela, what are you hearing from inside from your fiance, from other people? What's the conditions inside? I mean, the staff is who's bringing it in because the inmates aren't going anywhere. So I feel like if you would testing, testing, testing with the staff and you wouldn't have that outbreak in the prisons. But the, I don't feel that uh, he's he's he feels that um, there's not enough testing as far as vaccination. The, the correction officers just started getting vaccinated last month. And so at the begin, the end of last month, the beginning of this month, they start testing the more vulnerable inmates. Now, as far as when he when he contracted the virus, his he didn't know it. He had he had went he had been sick for a week, and we had called in a wellness checks, and it was like okay, well, okay. So that morning before he was rushed out to the hospital. I had called his attorney and she had said that his case was on the governor's desk and he had, he didn't get a chance to hear it until he got out of the hospital. So he waited a couple of months and this was in May and he heard in October, the last week of the 181 days, he heard that he had been denied. Now he has been in prison for 36 years. He has lost every family member except a niece and her children. Um, so by the governor saying, you know, the parole, once the parole board says, because that wasn't his first time going up before the parole board, he had went up before three other times. This was the first time that he had actually was recommended by the parole board to go to the governor. And I mean, with the pandemic going on, I think those people are some of the ones that should be released. That would, I mean, he had did 36 years and he had contracted the virus. And we're not sure whether, like if the doctor would say, I would want to ask him, can you get reinfected? Or if a new variant comes, can you get that variant? Because, mm -hmm. you know, so um, it, it, it would have been just best for the governor to have just let him go. I mean, he he hasn't had any problems since he's been in jail. He has no tickets, not been in trouble. He doesn't, you know, he works, goes to church, and that's it. And he had his evaluations, and his evaluations seemed to come out okay, except the last one from a, the doctor that has since been let go. And I think that's the that's the decision the govern that's the evaluation the governor made his decision on. And so I feel like if the commissioners said yes with the evaluate both evaluations, the commissioners say yes, you know, and then you go up before the governor. I feel like the commission, the commissioners, they know more about the process. They know more about the inmates and the process the the amount of time they have had you know they have more access to all that information more so than the governor now he did let people go but they were already a hundred and some days out from leaving anyway they were being released anyway so 
that really did not help those who are elderly that are ill, but they're not, they haven't, they're not on their way out the door. That's that's what we need. That's what we yeah. need. Yeah, and, and in fact, I thought there was a request, uh, Mark, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, for the governor to release a couple thousand elderly prisoners, but instead he released short-term misdemeanors, uh, people with six months and so on, but he didn't do anything about the senior citizens at all. What's being done about that, Mark? Is there any kind of legal action being taken? Yeah, that's a terrific question. You know, there ha there has been litigation and there's a couple of things going on right now. And I think Ms. Sessom's you know, what she has shared with us is just a, a glaring example of how the system with the governor's role in the parole process uh, is, is not working, right? And so we have thousands of people, as you know, who are, who are uh, elderly over the age of 60 uh, in our Maryland prisons who are very uh, low risk to reoffend, but very high risk uh, to contract COVID. Right. And so there's no reason that they should be kept there. We have legislation literally being voted on this week, once again, uh, Eddie, to remove the governor from the parole process. And it's time for the uh, for the legislature to do that. Um, Ms. Sessoms, correct me if I'm wrong. The way I understand it is that your fiance, who, who as I understand, has been incarcerated for uh, over 35 years. He is uh, one of the people who went to prison on a, a life sentence eligible for parole when he was a juvenile, so under the age of 18, which yes. the Supreme Court has said he, he, he should have a meaningful uh, opportunity for release. Yes. He went before the parole board, the parole commission, was recommended for release, yes. then contracted COVID, was hospitalized, placed on a ventilator, and then returned to the prison at which point then the governor denied the recommendation or the request that he be released. Exactly. I can, I can, if I have that right, I cannot understand how someone who has been recommended for parole by the parole commissioners, as you said, people who looked at his case very closely, who met him um, and, and looked at how he would do, then contracted COVID and was on a ventilator and hospitalized and went back to prison. And then the governor rejected the recommendation for him to be released. I can't imagine how anyone uh, could conclude that the system is working in that respect, either as it relates to COVID or as it relates to the parole process. How do you feel, Pamela? Is this stress on you, your family, and so on? How How is this yes, set with you? It's very stressful because I live in another state. So I, I was going to visit him. At least he got, like I said, he lost all his family except his niece. So I was the only one and her in his life that could visit, can this. So his home plan is with her. So if necessary, I would have moved back to Baltimore, back to Maryland. So uh, his, it, to me, I see him study, I mean, more so, he's not physically ill, but emotionally, it's taken a toll on him. It really is. It's, it's taken a toll on him. And now it's started him to get medical issues. He has high blood pressure now. And, you know, it's just, like you said, the governor, whoever's running this, who's, who's ever making these decisions, they need some assistance in how to go about uh, taking care of each, I mean, if each prison is on the same mandate, but each one on doing their own separate thing when it comes to shifting prisoners, testing, and, and it's very important that the correctional officers be tested. They should be tested at least twice a week. Oh, uh, yeah. And I'm thinking, Pamela, uh, and, and I know there were like organized activities, uh, uh, groups uh, in Maryland and in Baltimore that's rallying. And of course, I realize you're not here, but they are doing letters and stuff. Yes, uh, I'm still involved. I'm still involved from here. I'm still involved. Okay. Yeah, I, I go to Zoom meetings, I email, I call. 
you know, uh, yes, I'm still involved, even though I'm not there. I, I, I'm able to be involved. And um, I just, I don't know, I just, I just wish they would send them home. You know, there are the people that should be able to come home. People that are on cane, that have canes, they can't hardly walk. They're in their 70s, you know, yeah. release them. I mean, they're at, they're not, they're at a low risk. Like he said, they're at low risk for re-entry, but they're at high risk to contract the virus. And, yeah. the, and they're, by them moving different inmates from different prisons, you're bringing in different variants. Like the, yeah. you brought the UK variant to MCIJ. Now, I don't know if that was another inmate. I don't know if that was a correctional officer. But if you are working in a situation like that, because for instance, my fiance told me that they moved him twice. And both times he had to clean his own cell because they moved someone who had COVID out of there, moved him in there and moved that COVID patient somewhere else with, an, with other patients that are not positive. There's no room to, there's not enough room to quarantine, isolate, and um, have pos negatives and positives. There's not enough room in the prisons. They're just not. That's why they're intermingling. You know, that's why they're, well, you come on, even though you've been tested, let's go. Let's go over here. And then you find out you're positive. You got to move again. And there's no, like he said, there's no PPEs. They they have to clean their own areas themselves. And they have to use what they can. Yeah. Pamela, tell me this. If you could say something to the governor, and you can right now, what would you say? I would say, Governor Hogan, I appreciate everything that you have done for the prison system, for the inmates. But there's a lot more that you can do. For those that are left in there, those that are more vulnerable, those that have served over 20 years, there's more that you can do as far as keeping them safe. You're not, I don't feel that my fiance is safe in your institution. He almost lost his life there. And he's been in there for 36 years. And he's almost lost his life there because of the process. And okay. thank you very much. That's it. Okay. Mark, if you had some advice for the public, what they could do, how they could help support this effort to, to change these policies, what would you say? Yeah, thanks, Eddie. There, there's two things I would say. Uh, one is critically important now to contact their legislators uh, and to say that they should move to remove the governor from the parole process. Finally, take the politics out of parole in Maryland. Uh, so that so that the parole commission can do its job. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, they should be contacting the governor and and it, urging him and his administration to do more as it relates to the COVID crisis in in our jails and prisons. They have to get people out who are low risk to reoffend, and they have to make sure that there's protective measures inside, including. Uh, testing and vaccines. So those are the things that they should be doing, and they should be listening to people like Ms. Sessoms, uh, who understands, and people, quite frankly, like you, Eddie, who understand uh, that we cannot uh, allow people who are so vulnerable uh, not to be cared for appropriately. We have a, a moral and ethical obligation uh, to do that, and we have a public health obligation now uh, with, with the virus. So it's critically important that people uh, let the governor and legislators know that. Okay, so thank you for joining me, Pamela, Mark. Thank you. Nice for having me. Thank you for thank having you. me. Thank you, Eddie. I appreciate you always. Okay. And thank you for joining this episode of Rattling the Bars.